When Roxy and I were planning our honeymoon, we started talking to one of our neighbors who was a travel agent, and she gave us this big list of places to choose from. And, and there were so many places we wanted to visit, but we wanted a place that was warm, you know, possibly a beach setting, that had a little bit of relaxation mixed with a little bit of uh, excursion type stuff. So we, so we ended up picking this resort in Cancun. And we get there and it's just captivating. The palm trees, the smell of the ocean, the view from this beachfront property is just amazing. And you start to ask yourself, why Illinois? Why Illinois when this place exists? Well, the first thing we do after we check into the hotels, we throw on our swimsuits and we head down to the beach and we're just lying in the sand, soaking up the sun. And you ask yourself again, why Illinois? You know, I just don't understand myself. Why do I live here? A little while later, we grab some food and some drinks and then Roxy's ready to go relax in the pool at her hotel, so we head that way. And when we get in there, she hops into this water and you can hear the just gratification in her voice because the water's so warm and it's just, it's amazing for her. Now, while she's living this in this state of perpetual bliss in that moment, I, on the other hand, I'm standing on the first step of the pool with the water coming up to my ankles. You see, I, I cannot swim. I never learned how to swim. And on top of just not knowing how to swim, I'm deathly afraid of water. I'll pick up spiders in our house, make sure they get put outside safely. No fear whatsoever. Spiders, they don't scare me. I can, I can speak in front of one person or a thousand people. Public speaking, no fear of that whatsoever. But being in a body of water where I can't touch the bottom, y'all, I am a, the human embodiment of a panic attack. Also, snakes are the devil and they can all die, but, but water though, water is easily my biggest fear. So Roxy, she tells me and she's in this pool, say, hey, the water's the same height, you can touch, you're totally fine. So I walk on in and the water comes up to my chest and I can feel my breathing starting to get a little heavier, but... A few moments go by and I calm down and get used to it and you know everything's perfectly fine. So there, look at me, I'm you know, conquering my fears. Well, day two of the honeymoon comes around and we have this little excursion plan. We're gonna take this sailboat to an island and on this island there's an animal preservations and all kind of like nature activities, super exciting stuff. While on this sailboat, they stop right out in the middle of the ocean so folks can go snorkeling. And I was not privy to this information. I had no idea that this was gonna be a part of this excursion. But, you know, I'm on my honeymoon, right? So I have to at least try it. You know, I don't wanna be a prude. My wife, she loves the water. And, and honestly, when's the next time that I'm gonna have this opportunity to snorkel in Cancun? So, so I put on my life jacket and, and I ask the, the guys running the boat, hey, do you guys have any like Ninja Turtle floaties or anything? And they didn't think it was funny, but I thought it was hilarious. And I would have warned them if they had something like that. Well, I hop in this water <clears throat> and there's this big rope that's extending from the back of the boat for people to hold on to. And I'm, I'm holding on to this rope and just white knuckling this rope, holding on to it with dear life. And out of nowhere, a wave comes and blasts me right in the face and I lose grip of this rope. Water's in my snorkel, I'm hacking, I'm coughing, and I'm being pushed further and further away from the boat and I lose it. I'm splashing around, trying to make some kind of movement that would propel me back to this rope and, and you know, I, I, it looks like something's grabbing my foot and trying to pull me under the water because I can't swim. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Roxy comes and she grabs onto me. She's, she's calming me down with her words. She gets me back to the rope and, and assists me to get back onto the boat. And man, my hero, she saved the day. I get back on the boat and I'm shaking a little bit. I, I was petrified. I thought I was going to drown. Well, we finally make it to land, and I'm feeling my blood pressure lower as I take walk, or as I take steps onto this dry ground. And we start to eat, we grab a couple drinks, we walk around this beautiful park for a couple hours, and then Roxy on our map, she sees that there's this underground cave filled with water, and it lets you float from one side to the park of the park to the next. And she wants to try it out. No, I'm super reluctant. Because a few hours earlier, I had what I would consider a near-death experience, but it looks chill, you know? It looks like something you can hop on a tube and just float for three miles. So we do it. And bad 
bad decision. It's three miles, you have to actually swim, and so I'm holding on to the side of the wall where there's a rope you know, attached to the wall, so for three miles, I'm dragging myself along this rope, being stuck in this liquid dungeon of death, and it was frightening. Two of those experiences in one day. So there were a couple of days on our honeymoon that weren't so relaxing for me personally, but one thing I discovered is that large bodies of water they are actually representations of, of evilness and traumatic experiences for me. And to the Jews in the Hebrew scripture, or what some folks would call the Old Testament, water or this unpredictable sea, it was a common symbol of chaos. The Jews believed that this potentially deadly water, this uncontrollable water, was ruled by a personified sea monster known as Leviathan, which we also see in the book of Job. So if you read the book of Job, you'll see that word Leviathan. Now, all kinds of ancient Mediterranean religions, they depict their deities destroying or subduing the sea dragon. It was a very popular belief back in the day. So chaos, anarchy, cosmic disorder, these were the symbols for water in the ancient Near East. I apparently was born thousands of years too late because these are my people. That's their view on water. That's definitely my view on water. In Genesis 1, the author says, in the beginning, which remembers exactly how the author of John starts his gospel. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the water. I love that phrase, formless and void, formless and void. In Hebrew, that's tohu wabohu. I love that Hebrew word, tohu wabohu, formless, void, chaotic, darkness, disorder. And the ruach, the, the wind, the spirit, the breath of God swept over the face of the waters. Yahweh God and the Hebrew scriptures rebuked and tamed this watery chaos and brought order to life. So then we imagine ourselves with the disciples in this boat in John chapter 6 and it's dark and the weather is awful and the waves start acting up. Now the same story in Matthew and Mark, Jesus calms the storm but not in this gospel story, not in the book of John. And I love that because if we're honest... And let's be honest with one another, Jesus doesn't always calm the storms in our lives, does he? And that's okay, because that's not the point of belief in the divine and what drives us to follow Jesus. You know, how many of us can say that because we believe in God, that everything in life is good all the time? Yeah, of course, that, that, that's not how we experience life, so that's not our experience. We can't say that. Darkness and disorder are all around us. And it's only when we're able to embrace life's chaos that we discover that an effortless life is a lousy teacher and a fickle friend. We actually need difficult times to make us who we are. Does this shake the foundations of our faith in the divine? No, not at all, because what we see in today's story is that in many of life's situations, Jesus doesn't always calm the storm. But he does reveal himself to us, especially amidst the torturous waves. And that's the truth, my friends. That's the truth that we can be confident with and find hope in. The author of John has been driving this point that Jesus is the direct revelation of the divine. And through Jesus, our eyes become aware to the fact that God's love and presence knows no boundaries. Jesus reveals himself to the disciples in this story as, as one who, like Yahweh in Genesis 1, can tame the sea and bring order out of chaos. So we ask, how does Jesus or, or God or the universe, whatever name you want to call that which is sacred, how does that reveal itself to you? Is it when you're partaking in those things that bring you the most joy in life? You know those things that you just can't live without? Hiking, reading, working in the garden, listening to or playing music. You know those things that have this just inherent spiritual feeling to them. Yeah, God shows up in all of those things. And I think God is most pleased when we experience life's greatest joys. Or have you found that you see the divine most when you're 
when you've experienced or are experiencing the pains and struggles of life. Those things that shape us. Those things that show up when life is dark. Maybe a little bit of both. Maybe a lot of both. We, like the disciples of Jesus, are both aware and unaware at the same time of how God reveals God's self to us. And despite sometimes not having the eyes to see when God is or who God is, we have an open invitation to participate in what God is doing in this world in the midst of the tohu wabohu. My hope for you in this coming week is that you will see God somewhere, in something, in someone, at some point, possibly in a way that you're not expecting. And my prayer for our congregations is that you will serve as that Jesus figure for someone else, showing up and being the presence of the divine with a love that knows no bounds. Amen.